cost of those new facilities is as a result of the development and then they charge a fee on every single housing unit that gets a building permit. So whenever any of you come in to build a housing unit in your backyard or come in to build 10 units in your in that property you just purchased, you're paying that fee to the school district. So they're building up those funds to deal with the additional facilities that will be needed to accommodate the additional growth. Um, that was it. Yeah, that was it. Okay, we also have uh, approximately eight to 10 questions that I think are city manager related because it relates to, um, in a big picture of general fund, soda tax, other items. So what I'd like to do is put those questions in a parking lot, give those to the staff, Andrew, and then they can respond per the city manager's direction and department because they are not related to the topic of today. They are valuable questions and they need, people have, have asked it, so they clearly would like an answer, but I want to share with you that's a programmatic policy side with under the authority of the city manager. So I think, so I'll put those over there. So this set now of questions. I'm curious. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're good questions. What happens to the soda tax money that comes into Gerald Fund? I mean, you know, they're, they're good questions. They're not housing related. <laughs> city manager. That's right. That's city manager. Not, 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 not okay. there yet. Right, right. So th this set of questions deals with one, the environmental conditions on the city, of, the city of Alameda, given the liquefaction topic, is a question. Um, and if so, then given the environmental conditions of the city of Alameda, different question, how can the city provide the number of units that the state is asking for? Okay. So it's kind of in that environmental. And then given the extreme housing crisis in the Bay Area, how do you maximize the amount of housing to be built here in the area, in the city, given the environmental conditions, given the rent? So we do have environmental issues here in Alameda, earthquake zone, liquefaction, sea level rise. We, th those are real issues. Um, new housing projects are built to modern earthquake codes. Now, all housing built in Alameda now is three feet higher than the rest of the housing in Alameda, mostly. Like if you come out here and watch development along the northern waterfront, you see those trucks bringing in all that dirt. They're literally, we are building projects that can, that are that are designed to withstand earthquakes. Now, look, it, I'm not trying to say that every building that we've just we built in the last 10 years is going to withstand any earthquake that ever hits. Uh, that's I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, in the event of a major earthquake, I'm much more worried about the houses that some of you are living in that were built in the 1890s and 1920s than I am about the new units that were built last year. And for sea level rise, yeah, sea level rise is a real issue, but all the new housing, it's less of an issue for that than it is for those of you who are in those homes that were built before we started thinking about sea level rise. So um, we absolutely um, need to be thinking about that. There was a third question, which I'm, uh, the third part of that, which I've slipped my mind. Um, I'm older than you, so don't ask me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I doubt that. I know. <laughs> Was there another, anyone? Uh, no, I don't have any. Okay. Okay. Oh, yes, Mac. Good. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Brian McGuire, city planning Thank department. <laughs> the other brain in the, uh, in the operation. I'm just a talking head. Part. Um, the, um, yeah, how do we, you know, it's a, so this housing element puts a ton of emphasis on higher density housing. It's a basic saying, look, we are an island. We don't have a lot of land. We want to. We want to. We want to have higher density housing in a limited number of areas. Or our shopping centers. We don't want seventy townhomes or seventy single-family homes. We want eight hundred multifamily units. Small footprint. Getting in there. Small units are better than large units. Why is that? 
Well, because the demand, the need here in Alameda is for affordable housing. And the smaller units are more affordable. So there's a big emphasis on let's build housing, and when we build it, let's not sprawl it out. Let's keep it compact. Let's keep it transit oriented. Let's put it near transit. Let's make sure we provide transit for those units because we have the space for more buildings in the city. We have the space for more people in this city. Even with the full build out of this housing element, there's gonna be less people living in Alameda than there were at the time of the Second World War. It, what we don't have space for, frankly, is every single new person having one automobile and trying to drive around with it. That's where the space issue is hitting us. So the thing about multifamily housing, it's more affordable. It also generates less traffic per unit. That single family detached home with the two car garage spread out in a suburban format like Harbor Bay. We know this, we have the data. Folks in Harbor Bay drive more than the folks on the main island. Vehicle miles travel, that's documented. So, and, and it's not their fault, it's not their fault. It's the design of, their, of Harbor Bay. If you live on Park Street or Webster Street, near the transit in a, in a tighter density, like people who live near Park Street and Webster Street, they can actually walk to Park Street and Webster Street for dinner. And if you're in Harbor Bay, you can't walk somewhere for dinner. You gotta get in your car, it's not your fault. It's just the way we've designed it and built it. So, all housing units going forward, yeah, let's build it and, and support it in a way that it doesn't force people to get in their cars. It goes back to that transportation issue. Yeah, we we want we don't want to make our transportation system even worse. We want to we want to build housing that supports the direction we're trying to go with transportation, which is public transportation, water transportation, more buses, hopefully a BART train. Like it's no good to get a BART station if everybody lives five miles away and they have to drive to the BART station just to get on BART. We want people to be able to walk or ride their bike to the BART station. Um, that's So hopefully in 20 years when I'm long gone, people will be like, you know what, our transportation system is way better than it was in 2020. When Andrew was there, right. <laughs> Things got better immediately. <laughs> okay, here's a, a uh, another orphan. And I'm going to answer this simply without reading all of it, but essentially, why don't we follow, I assume that means Alameda follow affordable housing law. Um, I would suggest one thing, I'm going to give this to staff because this looks like a code enforcement issue because there's an address on here uh, regarding a neighbor. So we will, um, I, I will put this in the, in the parking lot and give it to staff. Okay, you can follow up on that one. Okay, this is a, I believe this was answered, but there are three questions regarding Measure A, and more recently, Measure Z, okay, and the history and like, but I think people know that pretty well. But there's a second part of this question that feeds into a number of other questions, and that is, okay, we're going through this process. I'm going to paraphrase. We're going through this process. What do we get at the end of the process? Do we get certified X? Are we in compliance? Will developers build it? If so, how long does that take? I'm just paraphrasing questions. And then there was another question over here that asked, okay, if we do this, what are our numbers? Where will we be in the next round of reading? Okay. The, um, I'm gonna do the last one first because it's just a really interesting question. I don't know, but my sense, having been doing this kind of work for the last, too long and you know having a lot of communication with the state of California over many years and just watching what's happening in Sacramento with all the new housing laws um, I I believe but I could be totally wrong about this but I believe you know the city of Alameda's 
regional housing need allocation every eight years usually hovered around 2,000 units. 1,700, 2,000, one, one round it was 2,200. Every city in the, in the state, this round is like three times bigger. Three times. Um, ours is 5,300. It used to be, our last one was 1,700. And this is every city is dealing with this. Um, and what you hear out of the state of California is like, we are so far behind. Like we've added thousands and thousands and thousands of jobs, but we haven't, you know, for, for every, I forget the statistic, every 10 jobs added in the Bay Area, we, the Bay Area has added one housing unit. Like, okay, now I see what the problem is. Um, so I am hoping that the state has taken this approach of this round, we catch up. This is a catch up round. Because, um, quite frankly, if in eight to ten years we get another arena for six thousand units, I mean, I, I, I won't be working here. Um, I, I feel sorry for the guy who's or a woman who takes my place. But <laughs> I'm really, I, I'm hoping that what we're seeing is the state trying to use this round to catch up, and then so that future rounds can be um, simpler. Um, there was two questions about Measure A. Um, it is. Contrary to fair housing law, I mean, fair housing law went in in, the ni in 1968, and, and cities and counties and states all over the country have been, you know, how do you do fair housing, and, and, and how do we, how do we, how do we change the way we've done things over the years? Um, it's a, um, it's, and we, and we, and in Alameda, we, we end up always. We get very defensive when we have these conversations about Measure A because it's like, why did you vote for that? Or why, why were the people in the, why did 1970, people in 1970 do it? What were they thinking? And some people say, oh, it's for historic preservation. Or they say, oh, it's because of traffic. Or other people say, oh, no, because they didn't want people of color. You know, who, I don't know. I don't know what, why people were voting for it in 1973. And frankly, I don't think it matters. What matters is what does it mean today to say, no multifamily housing anywhere in Alameda. And then there's another piece of it we haven't talked about, which is no residential densities over 20 units to the acre, which translates to one unit for every 2,000 square feet of land. So what you're saying when you say that is if you can't afford a house that has to carry the costs of 2,000 square feet of residentially zoned land in Alameda, then we're not interested in building that kind of housing for you. It is exclusionary and it's discriminatory. It's saying, if you don't meet certain income levels, don't come to Alameda to try to find housing because we don't do that kind of housing. Now, a lot of people then take the next leap over to the question, is it racist? And I will leave all of that up to all of you to make those determinations, because there is a correlation between race and income. But I just stop on the exclusionary and discriminatory. It's, it's like, if you're not of this income level, then don't come to Alameda looking for housing. And that is, in my view, the fundamental fair housing problem that this housing element is addressing. And what this housing element is saying, <laughs> yay, housing element. Um, <laughs> so, by the way, all those of you who think it's good, please call the state and say, hey, they did a good job. Because um, we're waiting to find out from the state whether we did a good job or not. Um, the, um, completely lost. I was, I was going to say something really good. Call the state. Call the state. Yeah, that'll leave it. I call the state. Um, somewhat of a sidebar. I know many folks in the audience um, about Measure A because that individual that was really behind that helped teach me baseball here. My dad is an Alameda High grad. I'm an old oldest and the old Lincoln School grad in St. Joe's. So we were here in Alameda during that during that time. So it's um, um, I, you know I, I don't think that commentary because I'm not staff to say this that it's a very, very challenge 
document to work with. And to the best, the staff asked for your assistance in working with us to follow state law, then do whatever we can as a community because there are groups out there, I've worked in jurisdictions, that will bring an action against your jurisdiction for non-compliance. I cannot state that clearly enough. As an Alamedan, I don't want my dollars going to a legal group to one, represent what I know that I need to do, and two, if I lose, I've got to pay the other side. I just I just don't want that. So I, I want to underscore the significance of what Andrews had shared earlier. That's just the state we're in, in the state of California. So thank you, staff, on that. The fear of, oh, if you allow multifamily housing, like, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff is going to get built. Like that's uh, many people believe that Measure A is what has made Alameda beautiful, um, from a physical perspective. What the housing element and the zoning that the planning board has been working on, and we've all been working the, the planning team. The zoning changes are huge, but they're all focused on this idea that yeah, we do care about the form, the physical form of our community. We do like the way it feels. We like the way it looks. We're going to stop worrying about who lives in which, how many in, in each building, what kinds of people they are. We're going to stop worrying about whether that building, if the, if the building is the right size, the right height, addresses the street in the right way, feels good sitting on Park Street or Webster Street or out here at Alameda Point, that's what we care about. And we're not going to care about how many units are in it. Frankly, the more the better. Like, we need housing. And small units are good because they're more affordable. So let's stop worrying about things like density and let's focus on building height, setback, lot coverage, the thing, and good design because those things are really important. And it's okay to regulate that. It's okay. It doesn't mean no regulation that we get rid of Measure A. It means no more regulation that is designed to keep certain people of certain incomes out of the community. So, um, this is not a, oh, just anything goes from this point on, of housing element, by any means. Okay, this is the rapid fire uh, round. Thank you, thank you. Because there's a number of cards that were submitted along this topic, so once again, I'll summarize. And I'll just ask you, the, this is no, the responses are not planning responses. So think we're in a deposition, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay I'm talking to I Andrew here. Yes. I, know, I, I know, planners, you know, we'll talk and talk and talk, okay? So a number of, of cards were, has the department decided what housing should be at the Harbor Bay Club? There is the housing element does not include the Harbor Bay Club. It does include the Harbor Bay Shopping Center. Okay. Has the city staff determined what housing would be at the Alameda Landing Shopping Center? We have zoned the Harbor, the Alameda Landing Shopping Center, the same way we've zoned the South Shore Shopping Center. Um, we're trying to encourage housing on the Alameda Landing Shopping Center, just like we are in South Shore. South Shore property owners are like, yes, you can count on us. We can do about 800 at South Shore. Alameda Landing, is, is they have not responded as, as proactively, so I'm not sure. They could probably, there's a couple property owner there's, owners there who I think are close to maybe doing 100 to 200 units over the eight years, um, but, you know, target they're not going to build any housing. Safeway's not going to build any housing, but there are some, you know, where the health club is and the swim center, that sort of area in that that corner of Alameda Landing. That's where we think if there's any housing built over the next eight years, we'll be there. Okay, we're back on the planning responses. Oh, good. Now, other <laughs> so uh, there are approximately three questions regarding supportive housing. What efforts? Are the city making and what are their strategies regarding supportive housing? Supportive housing, um, housing which provides support and very often for the lowest income folks or people coming right off the street. 
um, the, the folks who are are homeless without without housing. Um, and we're our city council and staff. We've been working very hard on this. Um, we've been working with Mr. Biggs in the back on the wellness center. Um, this has been when Doug came in in what. 2017, Doug's got, I got this idea on, on McKay, and I'm like, oh God, that's going to be hard. Never in my wildest dreams, Doug, did I think we'd be 2022 and we'd still be trying to make that thing happen, but it's a shame. You know, these are housing for 100 seniors, assisted living for 100 seniors. Like, normally that would get approved in Alameda. Eight, five years ago and we'd all be done. Like if there was anything that was easy to get approved in Alameda is senior housing, assisted for seniors. Like I, I never stressed out about senior housing. That was easy. Senior housing for formerly homeless, five years of fights. Cause why, what's the difference? What is the difference? Because they were homeless. Like all of a sudden there's a label and now it's a fight for five years. It's still going on. We're going up to Sacramento on August 5th to keep fighting because people keep trying to kill us. It's unbelievable. Um, the little bottle parcel, the city owns a little parcel over by Alameda Landing behind Safeway. Um, city staff from Community Development working on supportive housing there. We've made an effort to do some uh, uh, supportive housing out here at Alameda Point, formerly homeless um, at the Big Whites. Huge fights. Like it's. There's a stigma around people who can't afford, you know, it used to be for years through most of my career, oh, affordable housing was the, was the fight. Now it's, if it has anything the, related to the words homeless on it, it is just brutal. And I just, I'm hoping in three or four or five years, people will start just, oh, a homeless person is no different. I mean, there are so many homeless people who are living in cars that you don't see. Like, not every homeless person is that crazy person on the corner yelling outside my office. It's, these are people just like you living in cars. We have Alameda School District kids going to school at Alameda School District. Their home is a car. Like, this is a serious problem and we've got to deal with it. So, um, your city council, you know, the majority of them have been really solid <laughs> pushing this. It's it's tough. It's expensive. It's expensive and it's hard. But I think the city's doing an admirable job, just not giving up on the fight and just keep pushing. Because we got to deal with this. It's it's well, it's tragic. Thank you. So these last set of questions. One I think we've touched upon, but if you care to elaborate, if we pass this, what are the benefits from the a certified housing element, and what can we and future generations look forward to? I think it's, you have kids, do they want to live in Alameda? Can they afford to live in Alameda? No. I mean, more housing, more smaller units, more transit-oriented housing, housing at lower income, you know, that are affordable. I'm not talking about deed-restricted affordable housing. I'm talking about just affordable market rate housing, just an apartment that your kids can go and rent when they come out of college, um, number one. Number two, the supportive housing, like creating more of those lower income units so that when that that senior who's been living in, in some, you know, it, with on a fixed income, all of a sudden runs into a health issue and all of a sudden can't pay the rent. It's not, boom, now you're out on the street or living in a car. Um, you know, the, the trade up, the, 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 the need for those rental units and those more affordable units, market rate units that are in our rental. Um, you know, once we passed Measure A in 1973, like all construction of rental housing just stopped. So, you, you know, creating more housing at the sort of what we call the sort of the working middle, the missing middle, the lower income for sale product, so that those middle income of uh, uh, residents who are still in that rental unit, they would like to own, they would like to be homeowners, but the jump from what they're paying in rent to what they would need to pay to buy a unit 
I mean, since 1973, it was basically, if you can't afford a single family detached home with a 5,000 square foot lot, you're out of luck, go to another city. Um, we need to start building in those housing opportunities. And I think, you know, into the benefits, I'm hoping in 10, 15 years, less people living on the street, no more Alameda school district kids, homeless, um, you know, opportunities for your kids and your nephews and nieces to, to stay in Alameda and, and become, I mean, that's what builds community, like generational, you know, being able to stay here and, and, and continue to contribute to the community at the end of the day. And of course, the, the main immediate thing is avoid the god awful expense that you all are going to pay with your tax dollars if we don't get this done. Because those lawsuits and those fines that I described at the beginning, those are going to hit. They're going to hit immediately. And, uh, and, and that, those budget conversations about whether we should keep the tennis courts lit or whether we should hire another policeman, those conversations are going to start getting completely distorted by the fact that you're paying millions of dollars to somebody else's lawyers and to the state of California until you finally adopt a housing element. I mean, it's just... It's because at the end of the day, you're going to have to adopt it. It's the law. Thank you. So this last round of questions. Um, see, what's the best way? Because now we're going to discuss affordability. Okay. So a number of the questions, and I'm going to once again summarize this. Okay. So you go through this process of identifying. You have a certified element. Let's say we're all. Trucking, we're, we're, we're on good stand, we're certified, state says move forward. Yep. Then a number of the cards ask, okay, so how then do you build it? Okay, and given the current cost of construction, how is building affordable housing feasible? <coughs> so now we're seeing feasibility and whatnot, and um, I'll turn this back over to you, because I know those numbers. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm actually going to ask um, Mr. Lynch here to pipe in as well, because he actually does this kind of thing. But um, we, um, a couple things. One, focus on, on getting rid of the density standards, so that when uh, somebody who's trying to make a project financially feasible, one of the best ways to make it financially feasible is to allow them to do more units. If they want to do smaller units, that makes the cost per unit less. Um, the other thing is thinking about our processes. Time and expense to get to that building permit is a huge factor in financial feasibility. So what we're trying to do is streamline that process with all these zoning changes that all the planners are working on. So we as a community decide where we want the housing. Let's be really clear about what kind of housing we want, how tall, that height limit, that setback, Let's just write it all down right now so that when that property owner or that developer comes in on that property with a project that meets our requirements, we don't spend five years talking about it. You go, you, do, you go hire an architect, bring us a, 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 a good looking design. We'll take it to our planning board. We have, our planning board is really good. You bring us a good design. We're not gonna argue about how many units it is. Does it meet the height limit? Does it meet the setback? Is it a professional architectural design? Good, you're approved. Go get a building permit, go. The other thing that we're looking at is fees. Like cities in California, ever since Prop 13, start loading on fees. Fees, 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 fees. You know, the, our, our city council, we've I've already started this trend, like taking away the fees, the extra fees, especially for affordable housing. You're doing affordable, deed restricted affordable, Less fees for you. So just trying to make it. Big picture, and then I'm turning it over to Patrick, because Patrick knows this stuff well, more than I do, and when it really gets into the numbers. I'm a city planner, I do zoning, I work with the developers, I've never built anything in my entire life. He has. Um, but we, um, we um, you know, it, affordable housing in America, affordable housing in California, I mean, we as voters, we're, we're, we're basically saying when we go to the polls and when we talk about taxes, we want affordable housing. But we don't want to pay for it. We don't want to pay for it. We don't. We want the developers of housing to provide it on their dime. So 
the vast majority of the affordable housing that gets built in Alameda are market rate projects where we tell the developer, hey, 15%, out here at, tw at Alameda Point, 25% of your units must be deed restricted. So what's happening is the market rate units in the project are subsidizing the affordable housing. What is it doing? The good news, we're getting 15% or 20% affordable. It's just a drop in the bucket of what we need, but the market rate stuff is now more expensive. So it's, uh, from my perspective, at some point, we as taxpayers and as a society are gonna have to start thinking about whether we want to start putting our tax dollars into the production of affordable housing. Because right now we're just saying, hey, Mr. Developer, you do it, you do it on your dime. Hey there, this last part I was just handed, our community benefit, a benefit of new development. And then there's a series of, of, um, of carve outs with question marks, such as new parks, water shuttles, more transportation, infrastructure, et cetera. Everything that was discussed here is that a part of a benefit package back to the city? And I will assume as part of a new development. The person that wrote that, I assume that that's what the question might be. Just real quick, the um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we, look, we, we, we do with every project in Alameda, um, we think about what's the public benefit. Obviously housing is a public benefit, but what else? when we're redeveloping property, whether it's Alameda Point or the Northern Waterfront, every single project, and a lot of our new land that's being converted from old industrial or military um, to housing, it is along the water, so it, it's a great opportunity. Every project, waterfront parks. Every project along the Northern Waterfront, we require water shuttle landing, because we know we want to be running that water shuttle. I said earlier, every project since 2006 in Alameda there's a deed restriction that says, hey, every property owner needs to pay a couple hundred bucks a year towards transportation. So we have an Alameda Transportation Association that then that account is getting bigger and bigger. So they're providing subsidized tra transit passes, so transit, parks. Um, obviously, they're building all the new infrastructure for that, that, for that uh, project. And in Alameda Point, they're building the infrastructure that supports all of Alameda Point. So, Every new development is providing public benefits that all of us essentially benefit from. Great. Okay, in terms of, of cost for a unit, um, without getting into the weeds, as I can show you spreadsheets, we, we provide capital to developers, we provide capital to mitigate risk, we provide not only the equity, but also the debt. So right now we probably have, um, we have a significant amount in the California market. Uh, one of my partners, we've managed about 7,500 units throughout the state of California. We have uh, other projects um, that we have underwritten